IB Bio, Topic 11, Part 9, Sexual Reproduction A for HL students only, will have its focus on male reproductive anatomy and physiology, specifically the process of sperm formation known as spermatogenesis. The essential idea is sexual reproduction involves the development and fusion of haploid gametes. Here is the outline of all the available movies for Topic 11 Animal Physiology for HL students. Use this outline to find the movie you need for review. This movie is focused here. Here is the first IB syllabus statement, and it's an easy one. State that fertilization can be external or internal. Before getting started looking at the reproductive processes in mammals, humans specifically, it's important to contrast the internal fertilization process of mammals with the external fertilization process found in so many other species. External fertilization, seen here with frogs, requires water to sustain the egg and sperm, and it requires proper timing in the release of sperm near the eggs out in the open environment. Once the eggs and sperm are released, there is no further parental involvement. Due to the high vulnerability and loss of eggs, sperm, and embryo, substantial energy is put into building many, many eggs. The processes of internal fertilization provide inherent protection to the sperm, egg, and ultimately the embryo. Thus, with species like mammals and birds that utilize internal fertilization, fewer eggs are produced and the embryos are protected and substantial parental care is invested in the offspring. Internal fertilization requires complex cooperative behaviors between the male and female to bring the sperm and egg into close proximity, and it involves complex internal organs that are required for the protection given. In a terrestrial environment that is inherently dry, where the threat of dehydration is high and water balance is critical to the survival of every individual organism, internal fertilization is quite adaptive. In humans as representative mammals, the testes and ovaries are the complex internal organs involved in sexual reproduction. As well, the uterus in females is the organ in which the fetus grows. Through meiosis, haploid sperm and egg are produced and they are brought into close proximity of each other to accomplish fertilization, resulting in the diploid zygote. The zygote develops into an embryo, then a fetus, Following a nine-month gestation period of humans, birth of a baby happens. Species that utilize internal fertilization display complex behaviors to accomplish successful sexual reproduction, such as the display of the male peacock or the necking behavior of giraffes. Humans have an interesting interplay of biological and cultural behaviors that result in successful sexual reproduction. In addition to the sexual organs where spermatogenesis in the male and oogenesis in the female occur respectively, sexual reproduction also involves hormones. Endocrine glands involved in sexual reproduction include the sexual organs. The testes produce testosterone and the ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone. Spermatogenesis and oogenesis are controlled by two hormones originating from the anterior pituitary, FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. Lastly, oxytocin, produced by the hypothalamus and released through the posterior pituitary, is involved in stimulating uterine contractions at birth and milk release following birth. Here are two IB syllabus statements central to most of this movie. The first one should be a review. The second one needs to be strengthened from our earlier study in Topic 6. Annotate diagrams of the adult male and female reproductive systems to show the names of structures and their functions. Outline the role of the seminiferous tubules, epididymis, seminal vesicle, and prostate gland in the production of semen. Here is an image displaying the reproductive organs in the male. This should be a review from Topic 6. Let me review the male anatomy proceeding in an order that follows from sperm formation to sperm release. The sperm are formed within the testes, here, within tubules known as seminiferous tubules. 
The sperm, once formed, move to the epididymis, where they mature. Once mature, the sperm are moved, during ejaculation, along the vast deference, and proceed on a circuitous route that brings them past the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle releases alkaline fluids into the ejaculate. Then the sperm travel through the prostate gland, and the prostate also releases alkaline fluids into the ejaculate. Within the prostate, the vas deferens joins the urethra. The urethra carries urine from the bladder. The urethra is a common duct for both ejaculate and urine. The structures I've highlighted in red are the structures that you need to know. Here's a chance to test your control of male reproductive structure and function. I will let you do this work on your own, as this material should be reviewed from Topic 6. Remember, you need to be able to annotate the male reproductive system if given a diagram. The male and female reproductive systems are paired systems. There are two testes as there are two ovaries. In this image, we can see the two testes well, as well as the circuitous route taken by the sperm through the epididymis, along the vas deferens, past the seminal vesicles, into the prostate to reach the urethra. This image nicely shows the ureters that run from the kidneys to the bladder. Here's another chance to practice both name and function of all the structures I've displayed in earlier slides and movies. You can practice on your own. With this slide, we can look more closely at the internal anatomy of the testes where sperm formation occurs. Remember that this is where meiosis occurs to produce haploid gametes. Spermatogenesis happens within tubules within the testes. The tubules are called seminiferous tubules. The sperm mature over 70 days in the epididymis, seen as more tubules here, all of which converge to become the sperm duct, the vas deferens. Two to five milliliters of ejaculate contains approximately 240 million cells and has a pH of 7.5. This is a micrograph of a cross-section of a seminiferous tubule. Spermatogenesis occurs in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. Meiosis starts with a diploid cell on the outer edge of the tubule. This is called the germinal epithelium. It is a layer of diploid cells known as spermatogonia. It's located right here. The two divisions of meiosis occur in this direction, resulting in a haploid gamete, the immature spermatid, in the tubule from which it can be released. You can see the flagella of many sperm resulting from numerous meiotic events around the edge of the tubule. The form-function relationship of the two meiotic divisions proceeding toward the lumen of the seminiferous tubule is beautiful. Before looking closely at the details of sperm formation, called spermatogenesis. Let's quickly review the role of testosterone in spermatogenesis. This is a review from topic six. Just below the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary releases FSH and LH. Yes, FSH and LH are found in males. Both FSH and LH target the testes seen here as the entirety of this green box. FSH and LH target the seminiferous tubules directly to stimulate spermatogenesis. LH also targets a cluster of cells within the testes known as the interstitial cells of Leydig. The interstitial cells of Leydig, the Leydig cells, manufacture and release testosterone. Testosterone also stimulates spermatogenesis. Testosterone also feeds back to the hypothalamus to slow the release of FSH and LH. This is negative feedback control. So now let's dive into the details of spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis occurs in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. Here are the IB syllabus statements that move us forward. Outline the processes involved in spermatogenesis within the testes, including mitosis, cell growth, the two divisions of meiosis, and cell differentiation. Annotate diagrams of seminiferous tubules to show the stages of gametogenesis, the formation of gametes. Here is a cross-section of a seminiferous tubule. Spermatogenesis occurs here. 
Meiosis starts with a diploid cell along the outer edge of the tubule. This diploid cell is known as a spermatogonium. Two divisions of meiosis occur in this direction. You can see cells here, most of which are in some stage of meiosis, resulting in haploid gametes, the immature spermatid in the tubule from which the sperm can be released. You can see the flagella of sperm here. The interstitial cells of Leydig would be located here, or here, or here. These are located in regions between the tubules. And lastly, Sertoli cells, cells difficult to identify in this image, are cells that provide nutrition to the developing spermatids. In the micrograph on the left, the germinal epithelium is here. The diploid spermatogonium are just within that outer edge of the seminiferous tubule. The spermatogonia are diploid cells that first undergo mitosis. Now listen carefully. Of the two identical cells resulting from mitosis, one remains back as a true germinal cell and one proceeds into meiosis. The mitotic step allows for an unending supply of cells that would proceed through meiosis. Without mitosis, the germinal epithelium would soon be exhausted of cells that are ready for meiosis. The cells undergoing meiosis are here in purple. Meiosis proceeds in this direction toward the lumen of the seminiferous tubule within which we can see the flagella of sperm cells. On the right, a bit more magnified, again we can see cells in purple at various stages of meiosis proceeding in this direction toward the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. Notice the presence of sperm cells here. The Sertoli cells in green provide nutrition to the developing spermatids. Here is a nice diagram showing the relationship of seminiferous tubules with the interstitial cells of Leydig. The interstitial cells of Leydig produce testosterone. The presence of capillaries makes sense as the interstitial cells of Leydig are endocrine. Testosterone is released into the bloodstream. You can see the direction of meiosis as a part of spermatogenesis and the flagella of developing spermatids are seen here. In this micrograph we can see seminiferous tubules here and here and interstitial cells of Leydig that lie between the tubules. This is a nice diagram to study because it shows nice detail. The germinal epithelium would be located on the outer edge of the seminiferous tubule. These are where the diploid spermatogonia are located and those cells would undergo mitosis first and then meiosis, two meiotic steps that proceed toward the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. This is spermatogenesis. You can look, if you look carefully, you can see cells that are in the process of dividing. You can see the chromosomes. In the lumen, we can see immature spermatids, not yet spermatozoa. The spermatids must differentiate into spermatozoa. This is known as cell differentiation. Take note. Nutritive Sertoli cells are seen here with developing spermatocytes, spermatids, nestled into their membrane. Between the tubules, we can see interstitial cells of Leydig that secrete testosterone. In this micrograph, we can see diploid spermatogonia. We can see spermatocytes in various stages of meiosis and haploid spermatids that must differentiate, cell differentiation, into mature spermatozoa. Keep in mind, we're following these two IB syllabus statements. Outline the processes involved in spermatogenesis within the testes, including mitosis, cell growth, the two divisions of meiosis, and cell differentiation. Annotate diagrams of seminiferous tubules to show the stages of gametogenesis, the formation of gametes. This is an important slide to bear down on. This is the outer edge of the seminiferous tubule, and this is the lumen. The spermatogonium is diploid and undergoes mitosis to form two cells, one of which remains behind as germinal and the other of which proceeds into meiosis. This is the primary spermatocyte still diploid. DNA replication happens, then it divides through meiosis one to become two secondary spermatocytes, both haploid. Both of these cells then undergo meiosis II to become spermatids. 
that later differentiate into spermatozoa. This image nicely shows the relationship of the nutritive Sertoli cells in pink to the developing spermatocytes in blue. Once again, the diploid spermatogonium undergoes mitosis to form two cells, one of which, still diploid, proceeds into meiosis, and this is known as the primary spermatocyte. It is diploid. The primary spermatocyte goes through meiosis one to become two secondary spermatocytes. These cells are haploid. They go through meiosis two to become immature spermatids that later differentiate into spermatozoa. This image also nicely shows the relationship of the nutritive Sertoli cell with the developing spermatocytes. In this micrograph, these cells here and here are spermatocytes. Some are primary spermatocytes, still diploid. Some are secondary spermatocytes, now haploid, ready for the final meiotic division to form spermatids, seen here. Are you gaining control of this statement? Outline the processes involved in spermatogenesis within the testes, including mitosis, cell growth, the two divisions of meiosis, and cell differentiation. Here is the last slide that outlines spermatogenesis. This is a slide that I've made, and it should help solidify your understanding of the relationships among spermatogonia, spermatocytes, and spermatids. Spermatogonia undergo mitosis, and one cell of which, through growth and migration, becomes the primary spermatocyte. The diploid primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis one to become two secondary spermatocytes, both haploid. Secondary spermatocytes finish meiosis two to become spermatids that differentiate into mature spermatozoa, with further maturation to occur in the epididymis. Here is the next IB syllabus statement of the movie. Compare the processes of spermatogenesis and oogenesis in terms of the different number of gametes and different amounts of cytoplasm. Spermatogenesis through two meiotic divisions results in four small spermatozoa. Oogenesis, egg formation through two meiotic divisions, does not result in four eggs. Instead, the cytoplasm is unevenly divided. One large egg is formed along with three polar bodies that degenerate. Spermatogenesis through two meiotic divisions results in four small spermatozoa. Oogenesis, egg formation through two meiotic divisions, does not result in four functional eggs. Instead, the cytoplasm is unevenly divided. One large egg is formed along with three polar bodies that degenerate. Also in this image, the micrograph in the center shows the distinct difference in size between sperm and the egg. Here's the IB syllabus statement again. Compare the processes of spermatogenesis and oogenesis in terms of the number of gametes and different amounts of cytoplasm. Spermatogenesis results in four small gametes uh, following two meiotic divisions, whereas oogenesis produces one large gamete with three polar bodies after two meiotic divisions. Spermatogenesis, millions of sperm are released upon ejaculation, whereas with ovulation in oogenesis, there's only one egg per month from puberty until menopause. Can you identify the numbered structures? Interstitial cells of Leydig, spermatogonia, Sertoli cell, spermatocytes in some stage of meiosis, and spermatozoa. And lastly, let's take a look at the structure of spermatozoa. Here's the relevant IB syllabus statement, annotated diagram of a mature sperm to indicate functions. Here is a diagram of a sperm. You can see the haploid nucleus, the mitochondrion, and the flagella. The functions of these structures should be familiar to you. The acrosome is like a vacuole that contains enzymes necessary for the sperm to reach the egg. The acrosome breaks open as the sperm contacts the outer layers of the egg and digests away those outer layers, allowing the sperm cell membrane to contact the egg cell membrane. Details on this process will be provided in Topic 11, Part 10, Reproduction B. Once again, we can see the acrosome, the haploid nucleus, the mitochondrion, and the flagella. 
entirely surrounded by a cell membrane. This is a single cell. The acrosome is a vacuole within the cell that breaks open as the sperm contacts the outer layers of the egg, and those enzymes digest away those outer layers, allowing the sperm cell membrane to contact the egg cell membrane. Here's a micrograph of the head of the sperm. This will include the nucleus and the acrosome, and here's the large mitochondrion. Millions of sperm are formed every day. Spermatogenesis requires 70 days for full maturation. Sperm will live for approximately two days, 48 hours after they've been ejaculated. Approximately 100 million cells per ejaculate. They swim one to four millimeters per minute, and they're produced throughout the life of a male following puberty. And that brings us to the end of IB Bio Topic 11, Animal Physiology Part 9, Sexual Reproduction A.